Hi, everyone. Welcome to this edition of The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and thanks, everybody, for uh, joining in early and chiming in in those comments. Uh, Ray and Jason, uh, Kevin's out there out uh, west uh, talking about starting corn silage. I'm not ready. Like, I'm not just mentally, I'm not there. Uh, and Milkabot, I'll have you know, Wheat Pete is not joining us tonight. So you, uh, you are the stand-in. So have at her. Okay. So um, welcome to tonight's broadcast. I'm super excited about this one. Yes, we do have to talk harvest. Um, and there are so many things that we're going to talk about tonight, uh, focusing on soybeans and canola, but there's going to be plenty of questions about combine settings and all of that sort of good stuff. But before, of course, we get to our guests and our topic tonight, I do want to remind everyone that if you collect those CU credits, uh, head on over to Real Agriculture culture.com slash agronomist tomorrow and let us know you watch the broadcast so you can collect those and dun, 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 we have a new sponsor so shout out to decisive farming brought to you by telus agriculture to adama canada and to the corn school adama canada Whew. Well, other sources of innovation run dry, Adama is here to deliver, leveraging the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative crop protection solutions to your greatest challenges. We're all in on you. Talk to your Adama sales rep today. All right. It is my great pleasure to introduce our lineup tonight. And no, I don't just have two guests. I have three. So joining me from Western Canada and uh, representing PAMI here tonight is Brian Lung and Lauren Greger, and from Michigan State University, Mike Staten. Welcome here, gentlemen. Good to be here. Thanks, Lindsay. All right. Now, Brian, you're based in uh, Saskatchewan near Humboldt. What does the crop look like out where you are? Uh, crops conditions are doing really well. Um, I think that uh, we're looking at a you know, def definitely above average harvest for this year um, in terms of yield. And uh, I think uh, we are starting to see the canola harvest coming in and, and certainly seeing the struggles um, with having a very dry environment and having a crop that's uh, uh, difficult to separate as a result. Mm, we're going to talk about that tonight. Uh, and Lauren, based uh, near Winnipeg, how's my hometown doing? Yeah, the hometown is doing great. We celebrated a win here on the weekend and uh, now looking forward to the harvest and, and some variability is what I'll say in terms of when you're driving through Manitoba, what you're going to find out in the fields. But uh, the dry weather is definitely helping and uh, we look forward to seeing what comes off here in the coming weeks. Yeah, absolutely. And Mike joining us from Michigan. I am told I am to say go Spartans, so I'm going to. <laughs> um, but Mike, what kind of growing season has Michigan had? It's been all over the board. It's been variable, uh, like Lauren said. We have some excellent yields in soybeans and uh, and uh, very little disease pressure until just recently. Um, we are getting some white mold come in. Um, and I don't know if you're seeing that in the canola crop or not, but we're seeing it in soys. And um, it's late, though. I think it's not going to be a problem. We've had some drought stress. And uh, mm -hmm. so it's, it's all over the bag. I think our soybean yield is going to be... Um, probably less than average. Uh, Brian, on, on soybeans here in Michigan, probably be a little bit less than average, I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I would say, so I'm west of Ottawa. We've had um, actually a wet growing season, if you can believe it. Um, and so definitely saw some white mold move in. Uh, but again, uh, we, we were okay, I think, early enough on and late enough into the season, um, not hearing huge reports of white mold in soybeans at this point. So uh, it'll be interesting to see. But we, I think, um, were the lucky ones in Ontario, uh, or for a big part of Ontario. I know there's some definitely some drought stress in some of the southern regions. So Let's get into it, though. We are for canola, as Brian mentioned. We are uh, certainly nosing into quite a few fields across the West. I think, Lauren, you're exactly bang on. There's some variability. Um, but we want to focus tonight on managing our harvest losses. So, yes, we're going to focus on soybeans and canola. We are going to talk combine. But I want to start first with the crop itself, with the plants themselves. So, Mike, I'll start with you. When we're talking soybeans, that to me means we're planning for harvest at planting time. How do, yeah. how do I wrap my head around that? What do I need to be planning for at planting time with soybeans? Well, I think one of the 
biggest things, and actually I think uh, uh, the Canadians, you up there were way in advance of us, is, is field rolling. Uh, that's just huge um, and a real big benefit. It's a huge harvest aid. Uh, Jay, if you'd go to picture number one, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, but it, it's, it's a field roller that we've used. And uh, what I like about this picture is it shows it under ideal conditions. You notice the dust is rolling. You notice that the drum is clean. And uh, if you look in the foreground, there's a couple of stones that are punched right in the ground and flat. So what that allows us to do is to just uh, harvest much better conditions, less wear and tear on the machinery, uh, less breakage, uh, less fatigue on the operator. With some of these big heads, a 50-foot head now, evidently, I've never seen one yet, but a uh, uh, 50-foot head, how are you possibly going to watch that whole width and keep the stones from coming into your, into your cutter bar? So this is, it does start at planting. I think another way it starts at planting, Lindsay, is with our variety selection. Um, lodging is a problem here in Michigan. I don't know if it is in parts of Canada or not, uh, but lodging, the plants will lean over and uh, make it very difficult. And sometimes they'll lean all in one direction if you get a big wind and you're okay harvesting one direction, but boy, you try to cut them going the other direction and you're just going to ride right over them. So choosing varieties that uh, are, are have uh, good standability and maybe our planting rates. Some of the things we found in Michigan is that we can reduce our planting rates much lower than and what people previously thought. Um, and that will improve standability of the soybean crop. So we're gonna get into some of the other images you have a little bit later, yep. comparing some variety differences for sure, because that is, I think, especially when we talk soybeans, a, a big part of it. Um, Brian, I'll go to you and switch gears a little bit here on canola. Um, canola becomes a knitted mass of I don't even know what you want to call it, pods and such. Um, it's a completely different beast. So we're dealing, but but by the same token, we're dealing with some unique challenges with the canola crop as well. What tools do we have to try and manage some of the losses that we're at risk of at harvest? Well, I think, think the, the same thing, you know, like uh, working on the same lines that uh, Mike started is uh, uh, definitely uh, selecting your uh, your varieties um, to make sure that you're working with suitable crops for your conditions. I think there's a there's a large slate of uh, fields or varieties that uh, that you can choose now, um, and uh, certainly there's things like pod shatter resistance is becoming more and more common. And uh, you know, and how you how you process uh, or what your farming practices are. So I think that uh, you know as as we go through. Um, how you have your, your farm and your practices set up, how you manage your fertilizers, your inputs, and your land base um, will drive your practices and ultimately impact your losses. Um, you know, there's there's a, a huge amount of information that we can that we can kind of go into, but I mean, you know, we break down the losses into header loss, um, threshing loss, uh, separating loss, and uh, and and how and how we practice those uh, our equipment and our varieties and manage it is uh, what drives those different types of losses. Mm -hmm. Okay, but and we're going to delve into some of those tonight for sure. Uh, Jason, who's based in Manitoba, definitely noting more lodging in both canola and soybeans in South Central Manitoba this year, especially the canola seeded in that second seeding window. So that was. Um, for anyone who was following along with the Manitoba crop, very late this year, went in incredibly late. The flood came just way too long, stuck around too long. So there was that sort of that second window that happened. So Lauren or Brian, I don't know which one of you wants to get a crack at this, but you know, why would we see all that lodging in, in that second window? Any guesses? Brian, this one's for you. So, I, I think that uh, you know managing your nutrients uh, and the varieties are, are going to going to show a, a lot of uh, a lot of the availability uh, for I guess for the nutrient uptake and uh, mm -hmm. it's the same thing. You if you have too many nutrients in like your wheat, for example, it's going to go down, right? You're going to lodge, and uh, you know there's certainly a heavy heavy crop uh, in in a lot of those areas with the moisture. Um, you're not moisture limited on your crops. Um, and you become, uh, you, you start just getting a heavier, heavier crop. Um, mm -hmm. Dealing with the lodging is probably more of the issue uh, now because you're not going to change that. And, uh, you know, certainly 
the results of the the testing that that's been done um, using harvest aids uh, will help that help, help an even even out crop. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Lauren, I love this. You're exactly right. If there's a question for Brian, you you let Brian know. And Brian, you let oh, Lauren no. know what it is. <laughs> when it is you usually see me hop in there first. Oh, yeah, there you go. I like it. All right. So, Mike, let's let's talk soybeans a little bit with that uh, lodging. And actually, Jay, maybe if you could bring up that lodging photo and that ver the varietal difference with that line between them. Um, and then, Mike, if you can sort of walk us through, you know, what's different and what's the same between these two plots. Jay will, Jay will get it in a moment. We just It'd be scrolling. number four, Jay. Number, number four. four. There we go. Thanks, Jay. There we go. Okay, so this, there's a line here, left and right. So what's different between on the left and on the right? The only difference is variety. Just like Brian said, that's so important as the variety selection. And uh, what this happens to be is uh, two different varieties that are entered into our, our state variety trials. So everything is the same, same planting rate, same planting date, um, same fertility. That's one thing I didn't mention earlier. Um, Potassium plays a big role in lodging. If we have low potassium levels, we will more than likely have soybean lodging. And the other nutrient, of course, and I think like Brian said, is nitrogen. If we do fertilize for nitrogen on our soybeans, we're going to expect lodging. So um, okay. those are some things that happen there. But the only difference between the left and the right on this photo, Lindsay, is the variety. And it's just so important. That's the place to start. I really believe that's the place to start on preventing lodging mm -hmm. in soybeans. I would much prefer to harvest the one on the right. Thank definitely, you. definitely. <laughs> yeah. It's also more ma more mature. Now, I didn't track the yields. Yeah. I should have probably tracked the yields on the two variety, but I didn't do that. Someone may ask, um, and I did. I did want to put that out there, of course, to everyone following along in the comments. Please, uh, we've got some great expertise here on the show, so please ask your questions. Work those into the comments. You can ask about combine settings, headers, all those sorts of things. And if we can't get you an answer tonight. We'll find you one. The other thing I wanted to throw out there is uh, this week's poll on realagriculture.com is which is your favorite crop to harvest? And uh, there's a couple options on there. One of them being anything but pulses. So there you go. Um, <laughs> you can go ahead uh, and head on over there and let us know. Or you can let us know in the comments too. Um, one of my favorites is wheat because I find it incredibly mesmerizing. And it's just, yeah, it's so cool. Anyway, um, okay. <laughs> and also, thanks, John. It looks like the horse behind Lauren is licking your ear. Poor Lauren's going to lose all his composure tonight, John. Okay, so uh, let's, okay, Brian, refresh for me. You mentioned this measuring losses or, or when we expect loss. We expect at the header, at threshing, and what was the last one? Uh, separating. Separating, right. Okay, so let's start, and then we're gonna, we do have a clip shortly, and we've got a couple really cool, we've got some survey results Lauren wants to go through, so we have lots to cover, but just quickly, focused on canola, if we're talking about reducing header losses, what do we need to be doing? So I guess the there's two uh, there's still two uh, I guess campaigns on uh, harvesting canola. One is uh, a straight cut, and the other is windrowing and pickup. And uh, certainly uh, for a straight cut, uh, managing your losses and and I think Lauren can probably talk lots about this part of it. Um, but is uh, managing your your timing, managing your varieties, um, as well as optimizing your settings. You don't want to be in there uh, swinging with the reel all the way down. But uh, Lauren, do you want to chat about that? Yeah, thanks, Brian. I was just going to say it might, uh, some of the work that we've done is looking at pre-harvest dates. And really that starts with your variety selection as well. And pod shadow resistance as one of those mm -hmm. traits that can provide some of insurance for keeping the pods and seeds in when you're looking at harvest time and managing some of the environmental losses that can come with canola. A lot of work that we have done has been looking at the different types of pre-harvest dates and environmental losses as a result. And that pot shad resistance definitely makes a difference in terms of how well the seed is retained at harvest time. Okay, so um, for those who aren't aware, because this is one of the things we're going to be referencing tonight, Lauren, tell me about the survey that PAMI has sure. done on, on, so spell out for, so what that sort of is, because we're going to refer to it a couple times tonight, Absolutely. I bet. 
No, 100%. Uh, that'd be great to just have a chance to give an overview of what we're wanting to do and understand really what is the, the standard loss that producers are experiencing when harvesting canola. There's been a lot of previous work when you, uh, in the early 2000s as to what that was, anywhere from 4 to 8% loss, and that's a substantial amount. Things have changed since then. We've had variety changes, have equipment changes, new options such as pre-harvest aids too to manage loss. Wanted to understand some of those variables and implications applications and we're fortunate enough to be um, supported by the canola councils to do a survey of losses as producers were running in canola harvesting whether it was straight cut or swathed just as they're typically harvesting and we took our team to the field and measured losses to understand what's a typical loss looking at the conditions the machine settings and variables that have impacted the overall loss rate for the combines that were part of our survey so it was across all makes all colors all models in order to get a good sense of what's that overall kind of loss rate that one could expect is going through that so uh really i guess want to say one of the important first steps was actually measuring loss i will say that as a starting point for anything is actually stopping long enough to measure loss and a shout out to our partner suregain and bushel plus for providing and equipment to do that quickly, easily, and safely. And I think that's one thing always when you look at loss, it's the time. And how much time does it take? Well, if you can do it quickly and easily, that helps to get that uptake. But one of those key parts is actually just stopping long enough to take that initial loss sample. Yeah, absolutely. A fantastic point about, and we'll talk about that a little bit more, is how to measure those losses. But being able to do it quickly, you're right. If it's fun, it, it gets done. But also, if it's easy, it gets done. But that doesn't rhyme. So we don't use that one as much. Um, I just, I'm going to quickly pause because John's got a great question building on the lodged bean question. So John says he's got lodged beans. How does he proceed? How do you set the head? So Mike, this is going to you. You're looking down at a whole bunch of lodged beans. What's your plan of attack? It kind of depends, John, on, on are they all leaning one direction? So if they're leaning one direction, um, then uh, you know, you've got a couple of choices. One would be to just harvest against the direction that they're, they're leaning and, and then deadhead coming back. And that's no fun. Nobody wants to do that. That's, that takes you twice as much time, um, but okay. you won't have the losses that way. So some other alternatives to that would be, the, probably the biggest one would be to harvest on an angle. To, uh, to the direction of the rows. And uh, not probably on a 45, because that's gonna bounce you all over the place, but uh, you know, I'd say maybe 20 degrees or something off straight um, will, will be a big help to you. As far as the header, what you wanna do there is you wanna push your reel out as far in front as you basically can. You really have to push that out farther than you would under good conditions. And you also wanna operate it lower than you would under good conditions. The other thing you might wanna to try to do is to tip the teeth back and make them a little bit more aggressive. And you'll know if you're too aggressive is if the cut beans are riding over the reel. So, but kind of angle those back and, and that should help to pick up. What you're really trying to do is pick those plants up a little bit before they get cut. The other thing that's really a big one is your real speed. So we talked about real position, low as you can get it and uh, as far forward as you can get it, but real speed is huge. You really want that real speed to be going up to 25%, well, 25 to 50% faster than your ground speed um, in lodged beans. So it really means slowing down um, is what it really means. Just going slow and, and, uh, and trying to pick them up the best you can. There is a picture, if uh, Jay wanted to show uh, number three, that kind of shows some lodging and shows the beans that we left in the field on, on number three there. So if you look at the top of the picture, you'll see how they're leaning and the direction that they're leaning. And then if you look in the foreground, you'll see the pods on the plants that were uncut. And that's because we were going that direction of travel with the leaning beans. Coming back was no problem but going with them was, was really a problem. So we were able to figure this out a little bit. We made some adjustments, um, but getting the cutter bar as low as you can, probably reducing your ground speed, increasing your reel speed, pushing the reel out in front. There's one other thing that you might wanna consider in really bad conditions. I've never looked at these, but there's people that have used them in dry beans before. 
and that's the vine lifters. And there is, a, I know I'm not supposed to recommend one particular company, but uh, um, there is a company that has some units that snap on and snap off very easily. And I think that's a very desirable uh, trait um, uh, characteristic of them. If you need them, snap them on. If you don't need them, snap them off. I think that's a good idea. So, oh, but one the company, other thing. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, but the company is not snap on. So... Anyway. No, it's not. No. <laughs> I didn't want to mention them. I caught myself. I almost mentioned it's, but I didn't. It's okay. You um, so yeah. the other thing I would say is there's a lot of air-assisted reels is what I call them. I don't know if you use them in canola, but yep. uh, like the air bars, uh, query wind system, those kind of things. In yep. soybeans, if you've got lodging and you've got those drown down tubes, uh, I guess, Jay, would you go to number seven? Um, it, it just shows these tubes and uh, if they're out in front of the reel and the plants are already le leaning away from you, you can imagine what those drop tubes are going to do. They're just going to push the beans over more. You're not going to have a chance of pulling them up. So really what um, AWS recommends doing is in lodged beans, you just tip them up and out of the way. You, you just tip them up. You're not using them in lodged beans. So uh, their system has that where you can tip it up out of the way. I think with the query, I think you actually have to take the whole uh, assembly off if you're going to do that. Okay. So. Yep. Um, okay. John says uh, he's in agreement, except he's worried that real speed set faster. Is that going to cause a lot of shatter loss if the beans are dry? It's a really yeah. fine line that you have to walk, John, between that. Um, and yeah. I, we have a fact sheet on my website that talks about this, but it is a fine line. That's exactly a very fine line. If you've got brittle pods and you've got lodging, that's a tough scenario. It really is. It just means you're basically going to have to slow down even further um, because you just, you, yeah, you don't want those seeds to hit the windshield. That's not a good idea. And, uh, but you also don't want to run them over and not take them in either. Leave them in the field and not cut them. So it is a fine line. But I think basically slowing down is probably the um, the ground speed is probably the best. You're trying to increase your real speed in relation to your ground speed. Right. Yep. So, Mike, here's an observation. Often when we talk about planting when we talk about doing a great job spraying, when we talk about being careful at harvest, do you know that the common theme is slowing down? And I feel like <laughs> this is, we got acres to cover in a day, okay? So <laughs> anyway, it's it's easier said than done sometimes, but I, yeah, I, I hear you and let's face it, these are big pieces of equipment, lots of moving parts, and yes, you gotta get the crop in, but there's no point in zipping across the field if you leave a whole bunch of beans out. So uh, just before we move to our next topic and and uh, and go back to a few things, Jay, I, I want to send a shout out um, to our show sponsors and to our newest show sponsor, uh, to Decisive Farming, powered by TELUS. Your soil has a unique story at Decisive Farming by TELUS Agriculture. We get that. See the bigger picture by digging into your field's performance today. Remember, ROI is only a portion of the equation. Visit DecisiveFarming.com for more. So big shout out uh, to Decisive Farming. Thanks for joining us here on the show. Um, I do have one clip tonight, but I thought with an extra guest, one clip would be plenty. And then here we are almost halfway through and I haven't even got to the first one. So one clip was plenty. Oh, and we lost Brian. Uh, maybe he needed a coffee break. Maybe he thought we were going to a clip. I don't know. Okay, but Lauren, I'm going to bug you next anyway. So... <laughs> You did you you did undertake this loss survey, this canola loss Correct. survey, which yeah, which is fantastic. You looked at a lot of different colors of combine. Did they all improve with work as far as so the opposite of that question is did they all lose crop and did they all lose less crop after some adjustments? Hmm, interesting question, Lizzie. What I'll say about the work that we found, the results, one of the, I think, most surprising things to me was when you looked at, we'll say, the age of the machine. And uh, mm -hmm. interesting enough, when you looked at the results, not necessarily an old machine lost more. So it really came down to understanding your machine. And that starts with measuring losses, but really key to know what your machine is, how to set it up for the conditions you're in. 
and that allows you then to operate it in an effective range as well. And that's another thing I'll say too, is that it's not just how it's set, but it's how it's operated. And those are some key points to consider when you're looking at whichever color age machine that you're using for a particular harvest, especially in canola. So some of the oldies were goodies is what Correct. I'm going to completely editorialize. Can yeah. can be. It can be. They That's can right. be. Okay. So there you go. For those of you running, you know, Wheat Pete's not here tonight, but for those of you who like running the older equipment, there you go. As long as you're careful, you can get it right. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, John says, fair comment on the beans being lodged that you have to slow down and says, you just have to pack more refreshments in the cooler that day. That's right. Some diet cola and vegetables and dip. Right, John? That's exactly what he means. Okay. Um, all right, Brian, thanks for joining us. Uh, sorry, we lost you there for a moment. Um, okay, so now we've we've talked a bit about the header. I want to move into the combine a little bit more. So now we're going to talk uh, threshing losses and separation losses. So this to me comes down to here we are talking about some settings and those sorts of things. So what do we know about managing losses at these two other times? Well, I think the very first thing that, that uh, we always bring forward is you need to measure your losses. Um, if you sit in your combine and you run the machine and you look at the little monitor and uh, tell you what it's uh, throwing over the back end, you're not going to get a good re representation of what's happening in the machine. And if you can measure it, um, then you can start managing it. I think those are that's probably the most important thing that we can say other than slow down. Um, I think that that is pretty much you know the, the, the common theme. We're running... Uh, 25 feet, uh, 25 foot headers, and now we're running 45 foot headers and 50 foot headers. And you can't push that same amount of material through your machine and expect to clean it and or to, to thresh it and clean it at the same speed at you know five miles an hour. You have to slow down. And uh, so managing your uh, combine settings is going to be something that you have to do on a continuous basis. And uh, you know I think that uh, we we also should talk about. Uh, safety make sure that you're doing things safe uh when you're doing that you have to get out of the machine you have to, to go measure it using some of the new technology is much safer than throwing pans uh you know getting really close to those wheels and and leaning in and getting your head in it so i think that there's better ways of doing it now and uh i think that's the, the big thing is uh is adjusting and uh so both with uh separating uh, or threshing and uh cleaning losses uh, you're, you need to make sure that you're monitoring what's happening in your machines and then making the proper adjustments. Um, I think the, the results of the survey, um, if we go back to them, uh, show that there has been there's significant difference uh, in the crops uh, between uh, different ambient conditions. So what we found was on a cloudy day, uh, there were actually higher losses than on a sunny day. I think, I think I've got that right. That's correct. And so the, the, the crop conditions change throughout the day. And you, the, other, the next part is, is that you can't adjust your combine and then set in there for, you know, 12 hours and not adjust it and not go look. Um, as the crop conditions mm. change, as the weather changes, the RH changes, the wind, uh, the sun, um, that changes your crop conditions and adjusting your machine to separate the MOG, what we call MOG, which is material other than grain, and the grains, uh, also that, that changes as well. So you're, and, it's, and it depends if the material, for example, gets really tough, then you're going to have to do a lot more threshing. You have to close your, your uh, concave and speed up your rotor um, in order to, to do the same level of, uh, of processing. And if you don't change that, you risk uh, overloading your sieves and uh, not being able to separate it. So it's, it's a complicated machine. They are. Um, they're a combine. They combine four actions into one, everybody. Um, Jay, can you zoom in? I want to like grab my screen and, and make it zoom in a little bit on the table. Thank you. Look how good of a producer we have, guys. Okay. Um, because I want to look at some of these factors a little bit. I mean, it's a great point. And like logically, and actually in the comments, we're talking about common sense. Logically, I'm thinking if I start in the morning, 
just as the dew comes off or, or, you know, that sort of stuff. And I'm running all the way to the evening when maybe the dew's coming back, you know, these sorts of things. I like logically, I think, yes, obviously it's going to run through the combine differently, but at the same time, how many times you get rolling, you get into a groove, you think it's going well, and then you sort of lose track of time and forget maybe that things like relative humidity, temperature, all those things have changed over the course of 10 or 12 hours or those sorts of things. So um, fascinating really to to see sort of the hard numbers of it. Um, and also I do notice at the top here, the maximum losses that were measured were 4.1 bushels an acre, which is unbelievable. Um, but that somewhere around that 1.3 bushels an acre, um, to me, that's probably worth checking. That's that. Now, so, but question about this, because I think exactly that you have to be able to check. Mike, how do you recommend farmers gauge losses behind the combine? Like, how often are you checking? Um, what, how do you sort of, how do you broach that subject on soybeans? I think with soybeans, it's a little bit different. Uh, uh, Brian, I really think that soybeans, the gathering losses are our biggest culprit. Uh, 80 to 90% of our losses occur at the header. So um, our, our, our separating and cleaning losses are much smaller. Now, there are some exceptions. If we're taking too much material into the, into the box, then yes, we're going to overload it and we're going to send some material out the back. But by and large, most of our losses, you look at uh, what the engineers have found, it's 80 to 90 percent of the soybean losses at the at the header. So I really focus on gathering losses when I do this. And Jay, if you would go to number 11, because this will sort of show you how we measure our losses. This is a, a slide of a field day that we have uh, every year. Um, this one happened to be near Bay City, and the beans were about 15%, um, kind of lodging and everything. We were in the field much earlier than any of the neighbors thought we would be on. Uh, they didn't think they were ready. But So what we do is we go into the crop a good distance, make sure everything's running pretty well. Then we pick up the head and we back it up. And we do not throw our squares. Look at where we're throwing the squares. We don't throw them into um, the the chaff mm -hmm. area, because we're not trying to measure cleaning and, and separating losses. We're really trying to measure just those gathering losses. So you don't want to throw them right up towards the front where that person's right in the, in the, in the purple shirt, I guess, maroon shirt. Um, you kind of want to be in between those two. You want to avoid anything like sprayer tire tracks, uh, anything like that that's an obvious anomaly. But we throw 10 of these one foot squares across the width of the head, uh, count them up and find out what we've got in, in pods on the plants, uh, loose seed on the ground, um, cut plant parts that didn't make it into the combine. Uh, there's just a number of things there. And uh, there's a rule of thumb, and you probably all know this, but four beans per square foot equals one bushel per acre. So that's what we do. We just add those 10 up, uh, divide by 10, divide by four, and that's the bushels per acre that we lost. I did not know that. So <laughs> now I do, um, which is fantastic. But that also sounds like an incredible tiny little amount in a square foot to equal a bushel. So it, it, it what is. are, yeah. So then, so what, what is a typical loss then? Like we see with these PAMI numbers measuring any, anywhere from one point sun. To, now we're talking canola. Um, right. So right. we have to think about these things a little bit differently, but if I'm losing just four beans per square foot, that's a bushel an acre. What is, what I'm, what's an average farmer typically losing? I would say if you're losing one bushel per acre, you're doing a pretty good job. That that's almost unpreventable. You know, you're doing mm -hmm. a really okay. good job. One okay. bushel per acre on the gathering losses, anything above that. Uh, so across the country, Ohio state did the best uh, survey, very similar to what, what uh, Lauren and, and, and Brian are doing is uh, it was done at Ohio state and, and they came up with one to two bushels per acre is what they showed on average, a bunch of different machines, a bunch of different producers, and just sort of found one to two bushels. There was other people that did this in University of Illinois, uh, did one and theirs was much more significant than that. Um, but, but I think the one to two is pretty realistic, but I will say, I know that doesn't sound like much, but if you get into lodged beans or green stem or short plants or brittle pods, mm -hmm. man, those, those losses can jump 
uh, significantly. That's under really good conditions, Lindsay, yeah, the wind uh, blows. Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I would, I'll have each of you know that mog, material other than grain, is one of my favorite agricultural words because it's a great one. <laughs> so <laughs> thank, you, thank you for bringing that one up, Brian. It's one of my faves. <laughs> Um, okay, so so uh, I am going to, we do have, and the show is moving along like I feared it would, um, we do have a couple questions uh, about pre-harvest aids with canola and harvest aids. So Lauren, so we do have a couple products to try and reduce uh, shattering losses for sure. But then we also have, of course, producers who are going to potentially be applying pre-harvest glyphosate to this crop. Um, or maybe swathing to try and and even out maturity. I'll use air quotes. Those sorts of things. So how, what do we know about how some of these products or harvest aids change our risk of losses uh, at the combine? Uh, good question, Lindsay. And I'll talk maybe a little about in two different categories. Depends on which pre-harvest aid you're doing and what effect you're looking to have obtained from that. So if you're looking for a dry down effect uh, very quickly, that won't that doesn't dry down the stock fully. That changes your characteristic and how you'd set your combine as well in terms of how dry your overall material will be going through compared to something that you have to let sit for a longer period in the in the field and your stock will be dried down completely and that'll shatter uh, the the threshing uh, characteristics will change and you'll be able to have a lot more material going through your cleaning system that's one of the impacts when you look at the different pre-harvest dates and therefore your effect on your cleaning system as you're setting your combine as a result for when you're looking at a couple of the different types of pre-harvest dates for uh, canola. Okay. Okay. So we have to be thinking about the impact on the whole plant Correct. and just how dry or not dry that's going to make it as it travels through the combine. That's one of the keys to start, as that starting point. What am I doing to the plant? Because the combine is a, essentially a continuous processing machine. And when you change your characteristics of what you're putting into it, then it, you need to affect and adjust your processing machine in order to get the same kind of result out the back and on, into the clean grain hopper. Okay, absolutely. All right. Um, Jay, I am going to go to the clip with Sean Senko. This is a Canola School episode. And then when we come back, we have a couple things I want to cover. Um, one, some of the some of the tools, Brian, if you can uh, catch us up on some of the tools that we have available to us to estimate some losses uh, and adjust the combine. And Mike, we're going to talk about green stems in soybeans and it's going to be fun. But let's let's go to the clip with Sean Senko. This is a Canola School episode on uh, managing harvest losses in canola. Well, the number one thing is, you know, we just want people out there actually looking um, to see what they've got for combine losses. Um, you know, we want to make sure that we're not seeing those high losses. Uh, a project done, oh, what would it be, five, six years ago now, we're seeing losses in that 3 to 8%, you know, coming out of combines across Western Canada. So we really want to make sure that producers are out there just um, stopping, checking, and, and seeing, you know, what, what is their actual loss on a, on a combine and making sure they're not throwing profits out the back. And can you touch on the importance of checking your combine more than once and even multiple times a day? Yeah, I know there's not that one setting that you can simply find and, and assume now your losses are, are good for the rest of the season. It'll change from, you know, a big thing would be swathing to, to straight cutting. It's, it's a completely different the way the material moves through the combine. But even just um, condition of the, the crops, so if crops been um, laying in a swath for two weeks, and still a bit green uh, stemmed and then you go into something that's been four weeks it'll be completely different as well so really you know every field you you need to be checking um, ideally and even multiple parts of the day you start in a tough morning um, and it gets you know really hot and dry in the afternoon that it's going to change how that material flows through a combine and, and what your losses are at. Do you have any fresh or updated numbers on what on average people actually lose by not checking their combine losses? Uh, like I was saying, there was some a study done. Um, it's at least five, six years ago now, and it's looking. It was in that uh, I believe it was three to eight um, percent loss out the back of a combine. It varied from, and it, ideally we want to be. I think most of the PAMI work says about two percent loss is kind of where you're still making use of that combine. Combines aren't cheap. You got to get something done in a day. So I mean, you can get below that, but that's kind of the efficiency curve where you're still getting a lot through that combine and you're not putting out much out the back. So that 2% that is, is kind of the, the key area to be. 
Um, yeah, and it, it, it varies a lot. There's actually um, some work being done again. Another uh, PAMI is doing a study this year looking at losses. So we'll have some numbers, um, uh, some fresh numbers in the, the coming years on what we're actually seeing for losses out there. And what sort of tools are available for producers if they're not quite sure how to calculate those losses? Well, the, the actual tools for measuring can be as simple as a, a baking pan, um, right down to, you know, there's a lot of uh, automated drop pans now you can you can pick up. There's multiple companies selling them to make it life easier and safer if you've got one of those. But don't be scared to try with a, a regular pan. Also, there's um, some good online calculators, um, harvest loss calculators, where it, it makes it really simple. You can just go in, plug in your numbers, and it'll calculate, um, you know, all you need is the size of your pan, uh, the width of your, your header, the width of your sieve, and you can pretty much calculate exactly what you've got um, for losses in the field at that point. So it makes it really simple to, to check. Great. Anything else you'd like to add? Uh, I guess at the moment, you know, it, we've been having um, a lot of uh, frost um, warnings and issues coming around. So uh, I've got a lot of calls on that. And just the, the thing I like to say is, you know, don't, don't panic when you're, you're hearing there's a frost coming. Typically, we don't hear about it till the day of or maybe a day before. And uh, even at that, weather can be very unpredictable and, and forecasting. So at that point, um, swathing the crop, you can't get the moisture down low enough anyway to, to be dry enough to be safe so it doesn't lock in the green seeds. So you're usually better off waiting, see what actually happens. You know, was, has a frost come through? If it does, you've usually got that uh, two to three days before the plants will start to whiten up and, um, and have any possible seed loss. So. You know, the thing I just really want to highlight is don't don't panic um, if you hear there's a frost coming. Wait to see what actually happens with the frost, and you know after that point you can make your decision. All right, I have a few comments to make, but before we get to those, I do want to send out uh, a last shout out to our show sponsors tonight, to Adama Canada, to Decisive Farming, and to our very own Corn School on realagriculture.com. For all of our agronomic content dedicated to corn production, head to cornschool.com. And thank you to our Corn School sponsors, BASF and Pride Seeds. Okay, so off, off the top, a lovely bird song. Sean Senko. I don't know where he was recording, but he's got meadowlarks and he's got all sorts of lovely things going on in the background, which I love. Um, and that was Kara Oosterhouse. Uh, that was her voice you heard on that clip. Um, and so he does refer to a few of the things we talked about uh, tonight, um, but a few that we are going to highlight. Um, but first, Brian, Lorne, this question is for you, but Mike, you can answer this about soybeans. Does the, let's say I have a modern combine, so let's say, you know, relatively new, does the canola setting really get me the best canola performance or do I still have to tweak it? Who wants to take that one? Mike, I'll throw that to you with the soybeans too, but yes. Anyone? I, I think, I think first off, uh, is uh, the motto is don't set it and forget it. Um, right. uh, you need to make sure that you're looking at the performance in your machine. Um, I would say that uh, the manufacturer settings, the manufacturers put a lot of effort into creating those initial uh, set points uh, for the machines. And that is a really good place to start adjusting it. Um, it's not mm -hmm. the finish point, it's the starting point. Um, and you don't know what you're doing unless you're measuring it. Um, so, right. and I'll give you the example is uh, the monitor itself. Uh, if you were to look at what's happening in the field, um, going from uh, half a percent to 1% loss um, might equal, you know, a half a bushel an acre if it's a, if it's a 50 bushel an acre crop. And you won't see necessarily see the change on the monitors. Um, but that is, there's basically a huge difference uh, going from, you know, half to one or half to 2%. And, and uh, you need to make those measurements to see what it's doing. Using the inst instruments that you have is a really good checkpoint and a reference to see if you're doing better or not when you're making these fine adjustments. Um, okay. I would say there is a, a good, great link uh, and a, I guess a process flow chart, uh, so to speak, for, on the Canola Council website. And I think uh, we have a link to that, right? This is for the harvest losses, I think, or the combine um, sets. No, it's, 
the combine the settings. optimization and the combine setting yeah the op there it is yep. yep there it is and and i think there's uh there's a really there's lots of tools available to to calculate the harvest loss but also to help optimize and mm -hmm. you can go through this and it'll help you uh pick out you know what what changes should i be making um there's lots of tools available um and and i guess it's not a one one solution answer for the different crops and the different canolas um, mm -hmm. when you go to the pod shatter resistant canola they put a lot of effort into the the agronomy into the, the genetics to make those pods hang on to the canola seed so you don't get the losses in the field but when you take that to, through the, the combine harvester those same seeds want to hold on to the pods and it makes it more difficult to separate them and you have to you have to try break apart the two separating systems from the, the threshing from the cleaning side um, so that you can optimize them both um, if you make one change you have to look at the impact all the way through um, there's another tool that we have in our in our uh, toolbox so to speak and it's called the kill saw and uh, that's stopping the machine uh, under load and uh, with uh, with the, basically the mat on the on the sieves and uh, that can provide a large amount of information to the adjustment so that you can see what's happening inside the combine. Obviously, you're not going to stick your head into the back end of a combine when it's running, but uh, it gives you a good insight into it. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes, thank you. It should go without saying, but we're going to say it that safety is very important, which, uh, you know, and Sean does bring up and, and I know that you've looked at some of these as well, that we do have some wonderful magnetic uh, catch pans and these sorts of things that you can drop at any time and those sorts of things. So um, there are some really safe solutions for doing this, but uh, yeah, no, Brian, that all, that all makes sense. Um, don't set it and forget it. I love it. Now, we don't have a lot of time left, so I want to talk about green stems because these, of course, too much green at any time, just you want to smack your head against the wall sometimes. But Mike, you've got a fabulous picture, which is actually quite stunningly beautiful, but also looks like a headache waiting to happen. So Jay, if you could bring up that that beautiful soybean picture, and I say that, as I said to Mike before the broadcast, soybeans are not my favorite. Um, and partially because they look kind of ugly at harvest. But this is kind of stunningly beautiful. You have these emerald green stems and what looks like mature pods. So what happened here, maybe A, and then B, what the heck would I do with this? Okay. Um, the cause can be from several things. Uh, we've all used some, experimented with some of these foliar fungicides and they'll have a stay green effect. So that's one possibility. Uh, a second possibility would be some viruses. Uh, bean pod mosaic virus might possibly mm -hmm. cause this. And then the third one, and the most likely, is environmental. Basically what it is, is you get dry conditions in uh, oh, pod set and seed fill, early seed fill. You get dry conditions during those conditions, and then you get some nice moisture and some sunshine later on. And all that photosynthate has no place to go. It, it just doesn't have enough pods to go into. There are not enough pods on the plant. So it goes into the stems and keeps the stems green. So that's by and large what we've seen in my career. Uh, back in 2007, we had a really bad case of it. And we did send some down to a, a lab to look for viruses and didn't find anything. So I think really what we see in Michigan is environmental. There's also some varietal differences here. But um, as far as I know, it's not available in the seed catalogs yet. I didn't really look that closely in the 2022 seed catalogs, but I hadn't seen it before that. But their companies do know that there are varieties differences so look for that if you're concerned about it but it's largely environmental and uh, so that's what happens now what do you do about it the biggest thing is you don't wait for them to dry down you do not wait for them to dry down what happens is those brown mature pods will become too brittle and you'll end up with some huge shatter losses. I know this is a really good picture and I, I don't want to leave it but I'm gonna ask Jay to go to number two if you would because this is what's going to happen to you if you wait too long. Mm -hmm. These are volunteer soybeans. And I've only seen this twice. 
I mentioned the 2007 uh, green stem. Mm -hmm. And then last year, this is from 2021, we saw a lot of shattering losses. So these are volunteer soybeans. And what that square, that orange square represents is roughly one foot. And there's at least 20 seeds oh, in that one yeah. foot, at least 20. So there's five bushel per acre lost right there. And there's some concern, some of the growers that talked to me about this, they noticed that there was, uh, um, you know, whether it was shatter losses or whether it was cleaning and threshing losses. And because you noticed in the chaff behind the combine, there would be a little bit greener than every place else. I really still think that it was a broad gathering losses, shatter losses. And I think what caused the greening and the chaff is you think about if you're seeding a lawn, you know, in, in August or September and you're going to seed your lawn, what do you do with that grass seed? You put some straw over it to hold the moisture mm -hmm. in. Well, guess what that chaff is doing to that soybean seed? It's holding moisture. It's creating an ideal environment for it to sprout. So I really do think that it was uh, gathering losses and not cleaning and threshing losses in 2021. So this is what's going to happen to you if you wait. So don't wait. That's the first okay. thing. Uh, make sure your cutter bar is in tip-top condition because this is one of the places where you're um, – they're going to be difficult to cut and you just got to slog yeah. through them and you just have to. But the biggest message is do not wait and, and just okay. get into them no matter how much time it takes and, and that you, you really do need to. Okay. Uh, there was, I will say 2021, we did see here in Ontario uh, on edible beans, but also on some soybeans, some incredible sort of standing shatter losses that led to um, some pretty, pretty amazing uh, amounts of sprouts happening at the ground level and was was rather heartbreaking to see when everything else went really well um, and then to lose so much right at the end. Um, so there you go, green stems slog on. But Lauren and Brian, we do come into this with canola as well. You've got tough stems, um, but similar scenario, let's say if you've got a crop that is ready, that is the pods are dry, but you've still got green, how does that impact how I'm going to harvest this crop? Who wants to take that one first? Brian does. <laughs> I feel like Brian, Brian, you can tell Lauren he has. Anyway, now Brian, what are you, all right. Well, I think uh, Lauren kind of uh, alluded to uh, it, uh, is the combine is a continuous process machine. And the idea that, uh, that you wanna optimize the combine tells me that the throughput needs to be as even as possible. And that's basically both the, I guess, the condition of the crop and the rate of the throughput. So the more uh, you can have things even, uh, the better it is. Um, now, you, it's always, as with anything with agriculture, it's always a trade-off. Um, it's a trade-off of about productivity through versus losses. It's a trade-off between uh, how long do you wait uh, versus waiting for that crop maturity? And, you know, honestly, year to year variations and uh, variety variations, it's, it's, it's a really tough one uh, to have to, to nail down. But, uh, you know, certainly using harvest aids, uh, depending on your year, uh, I think this year we're seeing that uh, it is quite early in the season, but uh, like in our local area, uh, the pre-harvest aids are coming to a huge advantage in turn in terms of drying down those those green stems um because the more material like that you have in your in your what you're trying to process you're going to get either more of it in your tank or you're going to lose more canola at the back end and uh mm -hmm. certainly you know with the small seeds that, that we deal with in in western canada um the the machine losses are going to dominate uh, a lot of your production so Jason has a follow-up, and it's okay if you don't know, because I'm going to also ask Jason, Mr. Vote, um, what have you seen? But with pre-harvest aid, so diquat application, so a desiccant, versus glyphosate plus heat, which in Eastern Canada is Aragon. So are you, I'll phrase it maybe a different way, Brian, are you seeing diff significant differences depending on the product used when it comes to green stems? I think, uh, Lauren, you've done the, the research on this one, right? Yeah, I, I'll amazing. take this one. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, right, Brian. I, I know what the answer is uh, going to be, but we'll let Lauren see. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll maybe just phrase the question slightly differently. In terms of the research that we did, 
I would say it depends when what you're trying to accomplish with that. Let's say with uh, the diquat, you have more green stems because you're trying to get in early and time that harvest uh, process. Whereas with the heat and glyphosate, you're going to leave it in the field longer and have it dry down longer typically. So uh, typically I'll say from our experience that we had in our trials, drier stems with the heat plus glyphosate mix. All right. Okay. John has a great uh, comment here. And I'll throw this out to the three of you. Here's his here's his thought process when setting the combine, okay? Rotor speed, concave setting, cleaning fan speed, chafer setting, sieve setting, carrying on. What do we think? Has he got it right? Would you switch any of those? Let's assume he's already measuring those sorts of things. What do we think? Brian, is he bang on? Well, I think uh, the... The, the, I guess if you look at it, the science is you can't adjust the rotor and the sorry the threshing side of it without impacting uh, the, the sieves. So if you adjust the sieves for the current rotor settings and then you start adjusting the rotor, um, then that's going to throw everything out. And it depends on what your machine is doing. And think of it more as an iterative process. Um, and it'll depend. It's like, for example, you can set it all up and you end up with lots of stems in your in your tank. Well, you're going to need to start changing your rotor settings, and then 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 continue on and make sure that you're adjusting your machine. So, I think as a starting point, the the machine uh, manufacturer settings is a great starting point. And um, I think adjusting your your threshing system and uh, tuning it, and then your cleaning system secondary is a is a good approach. Okay. All right. Um, okay. We are out of time and this has absolutely flown by. So um, I thank each one of you for joining me here tonight. This was a lot of fun and uh, I learned a few things. We got to, we got to talk about Mog, which I love. We had some beautiful soybean pictures um, we got, and some really great uh, practical tips here from each of you. So I really appreciate that. Um, and of course, shout out uh, to some of those tools uh, through the Canola Council uh, for sure, if you want to check them out. And Mike, Thank you for joining us and bringing your expertise here to Canada. It, you're not that far, really, as far as neighbors go. So we really do appreciate it, especially our Ontario audience, because, of course, so much uh, that happens in southern Ontario is just like what happens in your neck of the woods, too. So it's Very lovely sad. to have you here. Yeah, and, uh, and I really appreciate it. And we'll let you know how our harvest goes and if we managed our losses. So, Mike, thank you. Thank you, and Nancy. To Yes, and Lauren, thanks for joining us again. And Brian, thank you for taking all of Lauren's questions that he didn't want. Thank you, especially. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Okay, and of course, a big thank you to our show sponsors tonight, to Adama Canada, to Decisive Farming by TELUS Agriculture, and our corn school here at Real Agriculture. And next week, please uh, join me again. We're going to talk fall weed control. Uh, subtitle, Hey, That's Not Pigweed. We are going to talk about Palmer Amaranth. Uh, and Jason Vote is going to be on. And I've got to twist somebody else's arm to join me. So join me next week, 8 p.m. Eastern, right here. Cheers, everybody. <laughs>